Today on Inside Utah Politics, the race for the GOP nomination in Utah's 3rd Congressional District has a familiar ring to it. Representative John Curtis and former State Representative Chris Herod are here to make their pitch to you, the voter. Plus, the Count My Vote initiative fails to make the ballot. So what happened and what are the next steps for supporters of the dual path to the primary? Our panel will weigh in on the issue. Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Good Sunday morning and thanks so much for joining us for Inside Utah Politics. I'm Glenn Mills. Today we are focusing in on Utah's 3rd Congressional District and the two candidates seeking the GOP nomination. We begin with the current office holder, Representative John Curtis. Representative Curtis, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. You bet. So it seems like you were just here. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you were just here, right? <laughs> it's been a short six months. Yeah, I'll say. What What have you done in that six months, though, Well, that uh, makes you think you deserve another term? It's a great question. We're really excited what with what we've been able to do in just six months. We have our first bill through the House. It passed 392 to 6. We've introduced major legislation on public lands. Uh, put a bill in just uh, two weeks ago in Emory County. that will be a fantastic public lands bill. Uh, we have set up a team both in Washington, D.C. and here in Utah. Uh, we've gone a little bit crazy with town hall meetings. Uh, we're over about 50 now uh, town hall meetings uh, that we're doing. Uh, we've secured uh, committee assignments that we're really excited for. We think they make a big difference here in Utah on natural resources, small business, and foreign affairs. And we're ready to go back and, and, and take another swing at two more years. Okay, uh, a little bit of a longer term this yeah, time around. Yeah. Of course, you took over for outgoing uh, Congressman Jason Chaffetz. Uh, a little bit of deja vu in this race, uh, facing one of the two uh, competitors you faced last year and Chris Herod. Your thoughts on facing him again in such a close time frame? Yeah, you know, it seems very similar. I think some of the debates, the themes are, are, are very similar. Uh, I think we are able to show, and I'm able to show a track record of success both in the private sector and in the government <coughs> sector in, in Provo, Utah. And now uh, an additional very successful six months. And so w we feel very confident with our message. One thing that is different though is there's uh, less activity from outside groups focusing <laughs> in on this race this time around. What does that say to you about this race? Well, first of all, those outside groups focused really a lot of negativity into the race last year, primarily focused at me. So trust me, I haven't missed that, that outside influence. I think it's much better for Utah voters to decide themselves on, on the best candidate. In the special election, you went to convention. You didn't even make it out of convention. This time around, you were this close yeah, to making votes. it without a primary. Yes. Uh, your thoughts on the turnaround at convention? You know, even though I would have loved to have hit that 60% and avoided a primary, I felt very good about it. Uh, people know last year I was only received 9% of the delegates' votes. We flipped that in just six months to 59%. Uh, feel really good about that. Uh, what do you attribute that to? We have a strong message with w our first six months. People like what we've done. They like how we voted. They like the committee assignments. They like the town hall meetings. They like the engagement. And they're, s they're happy with their representation. Knowing that uh, you did uh, get pushed to a primary and convention, do you still stand by gathering the signature route as well? <laughs> That's a hard question because I missed it by 12 votes. And, and a lot of those votes were held back because I did gather signatures. Uh, it's hard to know. I, I think if people realize I had 9% going in last year, they'll understand that I wasn't willing to take that risk uh, again of missing that 40% threshold. Uh, when I only had 9%, that would have been a big risk. So maybe down the road, are you looking at potentially not going to I would love route? to be in that position where I had that type of relationship with the delegates, and we're going to work really hard over the next two years to, to get in that position. Let's move on to one of the themes that uh, we're definitely hearing out of this campaign, and that is this fight over the brand of conservatism. Yeah. Uh, your challenger, uh, Chris Harrod, says you're not a true conservative. Yeah. Your reaction to that? Well, I'm tired of hearing that, to be honest. I think the voters should decide that. Um, how, how, does, how do you justify that when 59% of the most conservative Republicans in the state just selected me at the Republican convention when I continue to win uh, in, the, in the main elections? And so my point is, is that I don't, I don't think there's some moral high ground that he has in defining who's conservative and who's not. Let's leave that up to the voters. Talk about your record as mayor. He points to it and says you raise taxes. Yeah, not uh, true. Yeah. So respond to that. Yeah, I mean, it's just simply not true. That was one of the frustrating things in the debate uh, was that 
you can say things and not have the evidence to back it up. I can, I can document the taxes, property taxes, which is how cities tax their residents, are lower today than they were eight years ago when I took office. As a matter of fact, if you factor in inflation, they're actually 12% lower uh, than they were when I took office. And that's just a fact. One of the things he brings up as a specific example is the UTA project. Yeah. Uh, that did raise taxes, did it not? It did not. Actually, um, that's, that's a big fallacy. Uh, well, to be technical, long before I came into office, Utah Valley, Utah County voted and, and voted themselves to raise sales tax by a quarter percent to pay for that project long before I came into office. That's how that project was funded. Let's move on to some uh, national issues. Uh, the deficit. That's yeah. a big talking it point is. right now. And you look at that and you think, how are we ever going to overcome that? Yeah. What do you do to chip away at that? Well, we've got to change uh, the way we, the whole procedure, the way we budget. This, this idea of letting things get to a point where you either shut down or vote for a large budget is a terrible place to be. Two really bad decisions. And you've got to go, you've got to go way back up the line and start changing things much earlier. Last year, the House of Representatives did pass all their appropriation bills, sent them over to the Senate. They were never voted on. That's where this thing started to break down. And we're back at it. The House is back at it again, preparing our appropriation bills for the Senate. We need to get them to take them seriously and, and vote on them. Okay, I have about a minute left. Let's talk uh, school safety and gun violence. Yeah. Do we need to s go through some changes to keep guns out of the hands of certain individuals? You know, I think a better question is, uh, do, do we owe it to these kids to reevaluate overall safety? And that doesn't necessarily mean the way we get there is by taking uh, guns away. We we're all Second Amendment people, most of us here in the state. But there are a lot of answers out there that we can do that don't offend the Second Amendment. We need to, we owe it to these kids to be pursuing those. Such as? Well, if you, if you look at what we're doing here in Utah, we need to bottle a lot of that and, and export it. Our, our hope squads in the schools, our Safe UT a app is amazing. It's saving lives every day. What about age restrictions for purchasing rifles? You know, I, I think the, the, those are all fine, and, and, but what you'll find, and I find in all these town hall meetings that I go to, is if, if the moment you go into that, you get this very divisive dialogue and you don't get anything done. But if we can focus on these solutions that are working, that are proven winners, th we can make a lot of difference. So just to be clear, when you say those are all fine, what do you mean by that? Well, so we, we can have that debate about bump stocks. President mm -hmm. Trump has already resolved that. So f in my town hall meetings, if we let the whole town hall meeting be about that, we never really talk about the things that could be done on the ground to make a substantial difference. So you're talking about intervention beforehand? Well, I'm talking about hope squads. I'm talking about the Safe UT app. I'm talking about counselors. I'm talking about early warning signs, catching early warning signs. You know, all the things. That if you look at Florida, there are so many things we could have done better, and, and, and that's a great place to start. Representative Curtis, the time flies by. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate Absolutely. it. And we'll uh, know in just a couple of weeks how this all plays out. Kay. Thanks for being here. Coming up after the break, we're checking in with challenger Chris Harrod, so make sure to stay with us.